All right, good morning. My name is Mary Leonard. I'm chair of the Department of Pediatrics and it is my great pleasure to welcome you to this year's Medical Education Forum on Innovations in Medical and Biosciences Education. And today we'll have a focus on creating a safe and inclusive learning environment, which is just a wonderful and very timely topic. Next slide, please. Um, first, let's uh, do our usual announcements. I want to make sure everybody knows that Kari Nado is going to be speaking next week for Grand Rounds on wildfires and climate change, their effects on children and pregnancy. Kari is leading this work nationally and uh, obviously a very important presentation. So please join us then. Next. Um, and then the following week, we're going to hear from Jean Chia, one of our faculty in general pediatrics on care coordination for children with medical complexity, also a very important uh, topic. It's something that the Lucille Packard Foundation has been very has been very much committed to, and importantly, this is in recognition of Disability Awareness Month. And so, thank you to the Pediatric Grand Rounds uh, Committee for putting this together. Next slide. Um, and then, uh, very important that everybody knows the annual Maternal and Child Health Research Institute Symposium is next Thursday. It's a full day event. Um, and we're so fortunate that Kelly Moley, who's the Deputy Director of Reproductive Health Technologies from the Gates Foundation, is going to be speaking. And then you can just see here some of the different topics. And we're going to very much showcase the work that MCHRI has been doing around diversity, health equity, and social justice. I hope you all know that we did a call for, we now fund grants specifically looking at the impact of racial, racism and social injustice on mothers and baby and children. Next slide. All right, CME credit's a little bit different today. So we're gonna record your attendance and send it to the CME office. And then within five days, um, we'll email you with your activity and ID instructions and to claim CME credit. This grand rounds, unlike uh, usual grand round, or this presentation, unlike our usual grand rounds, doesn't require text attendance. Next slide. Okay, with that, I'm gonna welcome Becky. And But I really wanna extend my congratulations and my thanks to Becky, to Allison, to our guest speaker, and to everyone that made today's forum possible. Becky, thank you. Thank you so much, Mary. Welcome, everyone. Good morning. This is our ninth annual Medical Education Forum, and we are so excited to have you here today. My name is Becky Blankenberg, and I'm the Associate Chair of Education and Pediatrics. And this forum is coming to you on behalf of an incredible committee who has put in a lot of thought uh, about what we should be covering and really wanted to focus on building, how do we build um, and create safe and inclusive learning environments. And so huge thanks to our planning committee and a very special thanks to Allison Guerin, to Serena Tom and to Ingrid Garnica who have done so much to put this forum together. Next slide. Uh, today, we have a really exciting agenda. We have a wonderful keynote that I'll be introducing in just a moment. And then we have two sets of workshops. Next slide. So our, uh, following the keynote, you'll be able to choose between two different workshops, one on conflict management by Sarah Hilgenberg, and one on how to assess your program's anti-racism efforts. And this is featuring Aisha Barber, from Children's National and uh, Lahia Yamane and Felipe Perez from Stanford. Next slide. And then in our second set of workshops, we have how to build and lead inclusive team. Emma Mori and Ty Winters are, will be presenting. And Terry Turner is coming back for a second presentation, a workshop on how to turn your work into educational scholarship. So we hope that you'll stay with us for the um, whole morning. So now it brings me really great pleasure to introduce you to Dr. Terry Turner, who is a distinguished pediatrician, a distinguished medical educator, a dear friend, and a really wise mentor. As a tenured full-time professor of pediatrics, Dr. Turner holds a number of prestigious titles, including she is the Assistant Dean of Graduate Medical Education at Baylor College of Medicine, she is the Martin Lauren Endowed Chair in Medical Education and the Vice Chair of Educational Affairs at Texas Children's Hospital. In addition, she is currently the President of the Academic Pediatric Association and the Co-Chair of the International Conference on Resident Education and the Education and Innovations Consultant to the American Academy of Pediatrics, the Committee on Continuing Medical Education. 
After medical school and residency training, Dr. Turner completed a master's degree in education from the University of Houston, focusing on medical education research. She subsequently founded and directed the Center for Research, Innovation, and Scholarship in Medical Education for the Department of Pediatrics and served as the chair of the Academy of the Distinguished Educators and chair of the Faculty Education Program at Baylor. I could tell you many more things about her accomplishments, her awards, her extensive writing, but I would like to share three things that really make Terry truly exceptional as an educator. One, Terry is innovative. She has developed a number of innovations in professional development, in teaching and clinical learning environments, in developing medical educators. Two, she dreams big. I will say this a personal account to having served on many committees with Terry. Terry's innovation is matched by her optimism. She is always pushing the boundaries and elevating the field. As part of her dreaming big, she developed the National Academy of Distinguished Educators in Pediatrics and a new scholar series within academic pediatrics just in the last year. And third, Terry is a generous and thoughtful mentor. Even in our one-on-one -on -one meeting yesterday, which was really meant for me to help Terry and let and answer any last minute questions, she was role modeling, how do you learn about another one's institution? How do you continually innovate and elevate medical education? And she ended up mentoring me through that hour session that was really meant for me to help her. I have seen her do this continually through committees, continually bringing others up with her. So with all this said, it is with great pleasure that I introduce you to Terry Turner, who is a dear friend, a phenomenal educator, and an amazing clinician. And uh, Terry, we are thrilled to have you come today. Well, thank you so much, Becky, for just that wonderful introduction. I'm so excited uh, to, to be here. And I also want to give uh, kudos out to the planning team this is a remarkable set uh, of workshops today. A and also this wouldn't happen if it wasn't for Serena, Allison and Ingrid. Uh, so, so kudos to you all as well. So as Dr. Leonard talked about today more than ever, we really need learning environments where trainees not just grow, but they thrive. And I'm gonna talk about three different uh, micro habits, growth mindset, psychological safety, and, and coaching. And when these habits are applied, they can spark transformation, not just in our learners, but in ourselves. And I actually changed the title just a little bit to call them micro habits. And the reason that I call them micro habits is, is because they're, they're small steps or simple changes, which involve slight alterations uh, to normal routines, but they can be significant catalysts for, for change. And I have no disclosures to report, but what I do wanna disclose is, is this lecture, it was developed by my trainees. So what happened was three years ago, we were at our, our intern retreat and, and I asked the interns, could you complete some postcards uh, on with teaching tips or advice that, that I can give our, our faculty. So this talk is their voices. It is their narrative. You're gonna see their quotes throughout because it is because of them that we teach. We're gonna go over growth mindset. We're gonna look at what are things that we can do as teachers um, and faculty to promote psychological safety. And really, what are those things that we can do to set our learners up for success? There's gonna be some polls uh, throughout. I'm gonna, at the end, I'm also gonna encourage you to use the chat to talk about what one thing you're gonna do differently uh, in the next month. And, but this talk comes uh, from the literature of K through 12. It comes from the, the business literature, from sociology and psychology, along with uh, the medical education literature. All of these things help us to improve uh, how we teach and interact in the clinical setting. And I was very purposeful in using the word catalyst. 
So catalyst increases um, the, the rate of a reaction. And you can either be, something can either be a catalyst or it can be an inhibitor. So I'm challenging us today that we be a, a catalyst to help uh, uh, change and the behavior and performance of not just ourselves, but our entire teams. So I like to start with a story. And actually this story comes from the Bay Area. It's in, in 1964, uh, Dr. Rosenthal did a, a study among elementary uh, school children in San Francisco. And, and what he did uh, was he administered a, a test, the Harvard test of inflected acquisition. And he administered it to all of the, the children in the elementary school. And this was a test that was um, meant to identify those children that would intellectually bloom over the, the coming year. So he administered the test and then he distributed the students into different classrooms and each classroom got approximately 20% of these students that would intellectually bloom over the coming year. And he turned and told the teachers uh, of each of those classrooms, which of the students would intellectually bloom. So over the, the course of the year, they retested the children at the end of the academic year and lo and behold, those 20% of students that were predicted that would intellectually bloom blossomed. They just, they just grew um, in their knowledge and skills. So by now you're thinking, why is she telling us this story? What, what is going on? Well, this test was just a standard IQ test. Dr. Rosenthal randomly put children in all of the rooms based on their EQ, uh, IQ. And he randomly identified 20% of students in each of those classes, randomly, to say that they would grow. And lo and behold, they did. And what does that mean? Our mindsets as teachers can affect the outcomes of our learners. And I'm going to say that again because it's such a powerful statement. Our mindset as teachers can affect the outcomes of our learners. Because what our beliefs are influence those children's behavior. They change in response to those behaviors. And then what you have is a basically a self-fulfilling prophecy. And this is called the Pygmalion effect. When Dr. Rosenthal went back and was trying to figure out what was going on, and others have studied this as well, not just in uh, education, but also in the, the business world, they found that what happens is we send silent messages to individuals. So these teachers uh, were found that they were nicer to these children. They smiled more. They taught more to these children, they called on them more, they let them talk more, and they gave more feedback, and not just more feedback, but more differential feedback to help them to um, get to the place they needed to be, and more praise. So it all begins with mindsets. And that's why we start with this. How can we be a catalyst and light the spark of self-belief in our, our trainees? And I personally feel that this is the most powerful tool we have as teachers. It has changed not only how I teach, uh, but how I lead. So we're going to start with the first habit, and I'm going to launch the first, have, have the first poll launched. So have you heard of the term growth mindset? So growth mindset comes from Carol Dweck, uh, a professor at Stanford. Um, first coined this term. So how many of you have heard of this particular uh, topic? Very good. All right, let's go to the, the next poll. Have you read the book, Growth Mindset? And not uncommon, 
what we typically see is a lot of people are familiar uh, with the term growth mindset. We've heard it. It's something if you have children, many in uh, many of the schools are, are teaching using this, um, but fewer people ha have read the whole book. I would encourage you, maybe the book is, is not the first place you start. She has a wonderful TED talk. Um, yeah, an 18 minute talk about the theory. And it's just something that I would encourage all, all of you to, to read. Well, when, she, when, when we look at this, uh, um, one of the questions that she had is related to, she asked the question regarding intelligence, what percentage out of 100 is effort? and what percentage is ability? So we're gonna launch the same question she asked individuals. So regarding intelligence, what percentage out of 100 do you believe is effort? Is that 25, 45, 65, 85? And we'll give you a couple of minutes to answer that question. So what percentage is effort out of 100%? So when we look at those, and, and again, the majority uh, of you all, about 70% picked the 65 to 85% it is due to uh, effort. And that's exactly how when Carol Dweck was looking at this, this question, if you believe that 65% or more of intelligence is due to effort, then you are on the continuum close to, to a growth mindset. And if you believe that 65% or more is due to ability, that's more of a fixed mindset. Now think about this. This, is, this can be similar to nature versus nurture. I'm a pediatrician and, and I am a, a big believer in this, the power of yet. I, I can't do it yet. And that's a component of, of growth mindset. Because if you believe that 65% or more of intelligence is effort, then you can work hard and achieve. I, at Baylor, I, I do a lot around learners in difficulty. It's actually something that's very near and dear to my heart. And one of those is individuals who don't do well on, on standardized tests. And what I oftentimes hear is, well, Dr. Turner, I'm just not a good test taker. Well, think about that. If I if I'm believe that my ability to take a test is around ability and I can't change that, no amount of studying, no amount of what I do can change that. And that's why, it's so important to begin to develop a growth mindset in our trainees. Multiple choice questions, it's a skill. It's something that you can get better at over time. Um, and when we praise individuals, we need to not praise them for how smart they are or how gifted, or you're a natural at that. We need to praise them for the the process that they did to get better, the strategies that they changed to when one didn't work, the commitment, the perseverance, the resourcefulness that they used. Because if we praise them for fixed traits, like how smart they are, they won't persist in the face of difficulty. And they will end up performing worse over time because learning is hard work. Uh, and when we've talked about uh, the different aspects of growth mindset. We've talked about loci of control. What is, what is in my control? And if it is ability, then I, I can't do, it, it's not in my control. But if it's effort, I can work harder. I can do things differently. Also, you have to think about what do I do when I'm faced with a challenge? Do, do I feel invigorated or, or am I anxious? When others succeed, do I feel inspired or do I feel threatened? And this year, COVID has, has been, it's been a, a challenge or an opportunity of growth for, for me as a leader. And the, the other day I got my, I bought a coffee cup that said, strong women look uh, challenges in the eye and they wink. 
um, because that's a, a component of this. How can I grow and be a better leader? There is some data actually from uh, the the from medical from the medical community about what our mindsets are. Uh, the the first one is work out of uh, the University of Oklahoma, and they found that they were about 50-50 growth versus fixed, and that there was really no difference between the faculty and the, the trainees. So as you get older, it's not that you're going to develop that growth mindset naturally. The other thing is, is that mindsets, um, your belief uh, is, is domain specific. So in this particular study, they found that 80 per, 88 percent had a growth mindset when we, they talked about clinical reasoning, that domain. But that dropped when it talked about empathy and moral character. And I do want to make sure and emphasize that this is not a dichotomy. You either have growth mindset or you're fixed. It's really a, along a continuum. And the last component uh, of growth mindset is, is around goal orientation. So thinking about what is a learner's goal and what are they directed towards? You either have mastery or you have performance. Now, now think about that. If, if you've got a performance goal uh, and that's your what your behavior is directed to, then you're gonna do whatever it takes to look smart, um, perhaps on rounds. So think about if you're a faculty member and um, asking questions on rounds, if a learner has a performance goal, they're not gonna answer questions that they don't know because they don't wanna look dumb. Um, and, and this goes along with our culture uh, of grades, which is, is very fixed. We're focused more on the grades than we're focusing on the mastery. In, in other words, the learning for learning's sake. The other is, is that learning is hard. And you know, that comes about whether that's multiple choice tests, whether that's clinical skills. And, and as a teacher, it's this model of support and challenge. Knowing when an individual learner is in that danger zone, they can't learn. But also when they're in the comfort zone, when it's too easy, we need to give them those gentle nudges to, to help them grow. I, I was doing um, some work with new program directors that had a, a site visit from the ACGME. And one of the things that they said was, you know, thank you for, for making this feedback to us like a warm hug. And even though we were working to, to get them through the, the site visit and to correct some deficiencies, it's, it's about those connections and how we support individuals through this hard work. When we think about mindsets, one of the biggest things that, that comes is this concept uh, of failure and how we view failure. Now, Becky talked about at the very beginning that, that I'm the, the president of the, the Academic Pediatric Association. But what she didn't say is I lost two other races um, in the APA before I became the, the president. Failure was an opportunity for me to do things differently. How could I get better? How could I, I grow through the, the concept uh, of this? And how could I be successful? This was really important and, and was brought home to me when I read this card from one of the trainees that says, try not to dismiss me for a week or two after I do something wrong. And so when we think about mindsets, we have trainee mindsets, we have teacher mindsets, and then we have the institution mindsets. And if you think about medicine, we're a no error culture. I also want to emphasize something. Um, I, I was working with a, a team about a, a month ago and they had a learner in difficulty and they were telling me about all the problems that, that this learner had. And, and I, I asked them, I said, well, who, who likes this trainee? And in unison, all three of them shouted, no one. And I said, that's the problem. Eat, everyone needs at least one person to believe that they in them and that they can get better. 
Because what can happen is we can get up in a set up to fail syndrome. And this is actually the opposite of the, the Pygmalion. And it is very hard. Sometimes learners can never get out of this loop because something happens and no matter how much they do or how much better they get, they can never get out of, out of you know, the, the event that happened that defined them as an individual. I also think it's really important that we need to be authentic as teachers. And if I would ask you, and I didn't put this as a poll, but if I would ask you how many of you all have ever struggled at something or with some task at any time along your training, I would imagine that 100% of you would say, yes, we need to teach individuals that success and learning isn't a straight line. And we all struggle with things and sharing our own struggles of what it was like when we were trainees and the things that we didn't do, do right. It's also about when we start conversations, when we're on wards or when we're in the clinic, to say, I don't expect you all to know all of the answers. I also don't expect you to do perfectly um, or to even do the task well the first time you, you do it. And sometimes we're gonna do worse before we actually get better. And I know I've talked a lot about psychology. Most of the data comes from K through 12 and psychology, but we also have data uh, from the, the medical uh, fields as well. We know that mindsets predict willingness to engage in preventive health behaviors. If a parent believes a child will get better postoperatively, the, then that impacts the recovery. And the, to me, one of the most impactful studies, which came out of nature in 2019, was that a less than one hour online module on growth, uh, growth mindset improved grades of the lowest achieving students. And what you see is, is that these interventions can temper the effects of poverty on academic achievement, and they can narrow racial, ethnic, and socioeconomic achievement gaps. Such a powerful thing in a short, less than one hour online module. So what are things that we can do as faculty to help develop a growth mindset in our, our trainees? And I, I encourage you to take a picture with your camera of these five questions. These are just five. These are some that, that um, I, I really like. And you might ask, what are some different strategies you could have used today uh, with a, in a difficult patient encounter? Um, how did you keep going? I know we had you know, 15 admissions today. It was a tough day. How did you keep going? How did you prioritize? What are the things that, that you did? Other things that we can do is just talk about growth mindset. We can focus on mastery goals. What are, not focus on mastery, but focus on um, self-mastery as a component of this. If you want to do a better presentation, what is better? Is that uh, less filler words? Is, is it uh, perhaps more concise or in the right order? working on how we praise um, individuals on our, our team, sharing our stories of failure and encouraging trainee self-assessment. But what I really want to encourage us is, is for us to model. So I want you to think about how many of us ask um, our learners how we could be a better teacher. How many of us model after a, a patient encounter well, these were the things that, that I did well in that encounter. But you know, the next time I see that patient, I want to, I'm gonna do X, Y, and Z. So these are the things we all, you know, we all want our, feed, uh, our trainees to seek feedback, but we also need to model those behaviors um, to encourage that among our trainees. All right. So now that we, we're gonna come up to the second micro habit, which is investing up front. And this one came about, uh, we were doing a session on residents as teachers at our institution. And, and we have our senior residents teach the, the session. And as they were teaching the session, one portion of the, the workshop was around each of these senior residents sharing tips that they recommended. And the, the first tip that, that one of the senior residents recommended, they said, know your student's name. 
and I kid you not, spontaneous applause broke out in the auditorium and people stood up because it's such a powerful, it's a powerful thing that we can do. It's a, it's a micro habit. It's, it's something that is so important, but can make such and can make such an, a big impact. There was a, a book called uh, New Kid uh, by Jerry Craft, and in there, one of the, the, the statements that one of the children said is, sticks and stones may break my bones, but at least get my name right. And the power of, the power of names is it makes us feel valued. We're more invested. We're more likely to, to seek help um, when our, our, our teachers and our, and our uh, faculty know our names. And it also shows that the um, instructor cares and builds relationships and community. So this is what my trainees spontaneously said. When I feel that personal connection, it makes me want to do better. It's almost as if I'm extra accountable. And they also said, I feel like I'm part of the process instead of being swallowed by it. So this is, is that habit too, building rapport and team psychological safety. And when you think about it, medicine is a, a very unique culture. You know, you have to stand up and present. Um, you, you're asked questions and uh, to identify gaps in your knowledge. You get feedback on your performance and usually only when you're doing it poorly or wrong, you feel like you are under a constant microscope. And saying, and this isn't just our trainees. I mean, if you've ever had, I had my mentor come in when I was doing one of my workshops and I can tell you, uh, it, it did feel like I was under a, a microscope. So what are things that we can do to promote psychological safety? And there's been a, a lot more in the literature, particularly over the, the last couple of years on what are things that, that I can do. You will notice on, on the Zoom, talking ab about pronouns. So even at the beginning of rounds, talking about you know, introducing yourself, I'm Dr. Terry Turner, my pronouns are, are she, her, and hers. Uh, it, it can also be talking about, we know that, that microaggressions are likely going to occur um, on, uh, when we work together in this clinical environment. How would you like me to handle those when they occur? beautiful paper uh, written by, by Bullock. And I also want to, to highlight work that you're doing at Stanford, um, Dr. Hilgenberg et al, looking at how to deescalate angry caregivers. And again, I know you guys are building on, on that work and, and workshops, just really important ways that we can help create an environment in, in which our learners feel safe that they can take educational risks and not be penalized. And this comes up with one of the other statements that one of my uh, residents wrote, we are learning and we make mistakes. We are always 10 times more frustrated and embarrassed for our faults than you are. Well, this is, is interview season for uh, residencies and, P and my pediatric residency is um, starting to interview over the coming weeks. And I reflected back and one of the things that I, I say to applicants is, is I hope you choose Texas Children's Hospital to be your training home. And I had to think about why did I use the word home? That, that's an unusual word. Why didn't I just say training program, um, your, your residency of choice, but I purposefully use the word home. And, and what I think about is, is a, a home is, is more than four walls and a roof. A home evol evokes many images as well as emotions. It's a place of safety and security. It's a place of belonging and nurturance. And the reason that I use the word home is I want, it, I want it to be the place where trainees evolve into their best selves. So one of the things that, that the, the resident said is get to know me as a person. Please take 15 minutes 
at the beginning of clinic, at the beginning of the rotation and ask me where I'm from, what I'm interested in, what I like to do outside of work. What's my favorite hobby? It's get to know me as a person. I'm not just the trainee or the doctor, but I'm also an individual. And these quotes really hit home to think about our, our learners can be struggling as well and ask them what's wrong. Ask me about my day. And they want to know about us too. They, they want to know about us as individuals, not just about, uh, about us as a pediatrician or a physician. So this is, is me. This is a picture when, when I was a, a child. I'm teaching my pet monkey Zippy how to toilet train. You know, it makes you wonder, was this a foreshadowing of my career? I'm also a developmental behavioral pediatrician. Um, but a part of this, when we share about ourselves and we build these relationships that we show we care about them, not just about the work that they're doing, about them as a person. And this brings up um, our, our next poll. And uh, the, the poll is, when a student or trainee is presenting, how many seconds pass before the learner is interrupted by the supervisor? So I'm talking about, this is not uh, about patients. This is about when a student or trainee is presenting. And FYI, there, there's no difference uh, on, on how, when they interrupt. Uh, how many seconds pass before the learner is interrupted by the supervisor? All right, let's see those answers. So the, the correct answer is 80 seconds. So it's one interruption every 80 seconds. Now we do give students and trainees a little longer than we, we give our patients uh, because we only give our patients 11 to 15 seconds. But one of the ways that we can show value is to listen and not interrupt. And this is an important, um, this came out uh, in, in the narratives that in the tips that my residents wrote, also asking me what I want to do with the patient, telling me to not hesitate to call for any reason and asking me what I want to learn. We also have to, and this was something that, that I've worked really hard on, is this concept of, of generationization and, and not glorifying um, what we did when we were, were trainees, um, not talking about work hours as, as a negative, um, but, but what it is, is it's just a different time and a different era. Our students and trainees work really hard. They care just the same, if not more about our, our patients. It's just a different environment that, that they work in now than what we did. And this is what Stephen Covey says, is that really next to physical survival, the greatest need of a human being is psychological survival. It's really to be understood, affirmed, validated, and appreciated. And why I like this is, is some of you may know of the five languages of, of, of love. Uh, Chapman and White have, have written about that, but they've also written about five languages of appreciation in the workplace. Now, these languages are similar to what they, they are. They're, they're words of affirmation, tangible gifts, acts of service, now, physical touch, it's, it's different in the, the work environment. These are high fives, fist bumps, which we haven't been able to do uh, with, with COVID, uh, but it, it's not the same. And then quality time. So when, when we were looking at some of the tips that the residents talked about, they said it's not even big things. It's more tangible, like food. When people bring us food, it's like, oh, I realize that you're working hard and I appreciate you. You know, we can, words of affirmation is the language that of, a, of appreciation that most people value. So these are things that we can do on rounds, um, in an email, can be publicly. Um, talking about, uh, again, using that growth mindset and, and praising them for, for doing things, like I said, 
with a positive attitude, with a smile on their face, um, looking at really being authentic and saying thank you for the work I do from time to time helps revitalize me. One thing that, that our, uh, some of our faculty do uh, um, on PHM, uh, one of the, the residents said uh, their PHM attending did this really well. Once a week, uh, they would tell each other something uh, that, they, that one of the other team members did that they appreciated. It took only five to 10 minutes and it was at the end of rounds, but it made such a big impact and big difference. So how can, what are things that we can do? We can build rapport, focusing on the relationship first, talking about promoting that psychological safety, reflecting on our implicit biases that we may have. We have affinity biases and, and recognizing that there may be learners that we instinctively unconsciously maybe like better than another and, and stopping ourselves and thinking about how is that changing my behavior uh, towards those individuals, the words that I use, the amount of praise that I give, the, the, the types of feedback, uh, getting to know trainees, sharing personal stories, uh, empowering the trainees. Basically, this is really letting them give the assessment and plan and then showing gratitude. And these are our residents. These are mine. And, and this is a, a picture a, a couple of years ago. But, but I think about this. We had a, a trainee uh, several years ago uh, who, after they matched, uh, had diff uh, they had had difficulty in medical school. But once they match, they're ours. That means it, it's my job to help make them successful. And what we did is when that, pay when that resident was handed over to us from, from medical school, um, we knew some of those areas and worked on the, the schedule to make sure that she would be successful. You know, developing a schedule didn't take a, a, a lot of, of, there was no faculty input other than creating the schedule, but she ultimately went on to become a chief resident. From having trouble in medical school, failing and having professional issues, to being a, a, a chief resident. It wasn't just the schedule, but setting her up to be successful and building self-confidence in the beginning of training was an important first step. So how do we set learners up for success? So when a, a trainee fails, who's responsible for that failure? And, and sometimes I, I, I point a, a finger, is it the, the trainee? But when, I, when you look, when you point a finger, one finger is pointing to the trainee and at least three fingers are pointing back. And the key to that is, is that we're both responsible. But, but the thing that I have control over is my actions and my behavior. So what could I have done better? What can I improve or do differently? And how can I make you, the trainee, feel more comfortable and build that psychological safety? All right. So what I'm going to have you do is you can stand up and stretch. I, I would have you draw a vehicle. You don't have to draw it. You can think about what vehicle you would, would draw. I want you to think about the color, the shapes. Um, think about the, the vehicle itself. What would it look like? Stand up and stretch as you're, you're thinking about that. Or you can take a piece of paper and just scratch on it. But I'm going to launch, uh, I'm going to have the next poll launched. And what would you have, what would you have drawn or what did you draw? So would you have drawn an airplane, a, a boat, a bicycle, maybe a hovercraft, train or a truck? Let's see what, what people would have drawn. Ah, 77% of you would have drawn a car. Well, let me say that 98% of you failed this exam. Yes, I said 98% of you failed this exam because I wanted you all to draw a rocket. I'm from Houston, NASA, rockets. So come on. 
you know, you, why didn't you just read my mind and draw a, a rocket? And, and again, I think this is so telling. And our, our resident said, please set expectations at the beginning instead of waiting for us to do something wrong before saying how you want it done. Just like uh, I'm not a mind reader of my significant other, I'm also, our, our, our learners can't read our minds on how we want it done. When I did inpatient medicine for, for many years, I, I would write the notes on the first day for everyone because what it did is it allowed people to see how I liked notes written, where I wanted the, the antibiotics. Um, it also allowed me to role model critical thinking in the assessment and plan on, on what I like to see in a note, what I included and what I didn't. And, and this is something that, uh, it was a study done many years ago uh, by Patricia Lai on, on setting expectations. And how can we do that? Is that how much time you want them to present on rounds? Um, how much time to, to complete tasks? What do you want them to read on? You know, oftentimes uh, on evaluation forms, I see the, the, ter uh, the words read more. Well, do we tell our learners, not just that they should read more, but what in particular they should read? Um, should they read the whole article or do you want them to focus on one particular thing like uh, maybe the, the treatment for a particular disease? Also looking at professional behaviors, we try to anticipate based on like the last year in clinic, what were some of the areas um, that maybe we weren't as explicit on and set those professional behaviors up front so that they know what's expected. The other is, is this concept of recognizing that I'm doing the absolute best and striving to become better every day. So our learners don't come to work and say, I'm just going to come to work today and see how badly I can perform to tick off Dr. Turner. Uh, or I'm going to come to do things wrong just so I can get feedback on, on how I can do it better. And, and my Shiro, Brene Brown, says, I know my life is better when I work on the assumption that everyone is doing the best they can in the moment. And I do bring in uh, one theory. Uh, this is self-determination theory, just one of the, the most important theories that we have in medical education that looks at trainees want to be competent. Um, they also, again, we've talked about that um, relationships uh, that they have, and they want to know that they have some control over the, the course of, of their lives. So one of the things that we can do is catch learners doing things well. And as I said, I, I'm a, a um, behavioral pediatrician. And one of the things we tell parents is, is that a child cannot have time out if they've never had time in. That goes with trainees. Um, the literature talks about that we should um, give them positive reinforcement four times to everyone that we give constructive criticism or constructive feedback, that four to one um, in that ratio, especially early. Remember, we're trying to build psychological safety. And uh, one of the ways I did this is, is I audio taped myself uh, on rounds. And I listened to the, the comments that I was giving to the, the learners. I'll tell you, I wasn't close to the four to one of, of the positive reinforcement. I focused everything on the constructive feedback. So it was something that, that I, I worked on to change to get better. And I'm not saying that we never give uh, bad feedback, uh, that we never give a constructive um, feedback to, to individuals who uh, is a behavior that they need to do differently. We all have those things, uh, our, our Johari window, that, that we don't realize that we are not uh, doing well. Uh, but one of the things that that I found is, is that despite the fact that I want someone to change their behavior just because I tell them that it's a problem doesn't mean that they're going to change it. And I, I think about a, a learner that we had that, that had um, issues with, with communication uh, with her patients and, and with the, the staff. And I, I could go in and we could have a meeting and I could say, you know, you've had these um, 
scenarios of poor communication and, and you need to change. And these are the things that you need to do. Now, she could change for a, a short period of time, but the point was it is she, it was a, a, an ingrained habit and behavior change takes time. She's going to have relapses. This is the way she's communicated for a long period of time. The other thing is it was really important to try to understand what was hindering her making the change. Um, this was about conversations. It was about understanding her experiences, working with her, rolling through. And I do a lot of, of motivational interviewing um, and knowing that there's, she's going to have relapses and really to support her self-efficacy and support when she's doing things that, that worked and talking her through when things didn't work. And, and ultimately, uh, uh, this, over this journey, her communication markedly improved, but it improved after the meeting that we had when she said, Dr. Turner, I know we've met for a long time but I think I have a problem in communication. And that wasn't the first meeting and that wasn't the second, but it, it was working with her and her developing that trust that made the difference. And I just wanna point out that you all at Stanford and in the, particularly um, in pediatrics have got this right. You guys have the model uh, of coaching you do it through growth mindset and psychological safety and again a learner-centered approach to unlock your trainees potential to maximize their growth you all have been doing it since 2013 you are the leaders in this and i'm so encouraged to hear that neurology and surgery ha have been doing it for the past year as well and also that the dermatology is coming on because uh, I, like you all, have given tons of feedback, and I just haven't moved the needle. But coaching is what makes the difference. It, it's what allows our, our trainees to actually grow. And one thing, it, it, you can also do this uh, on the front lines. Um, these questions come from uh, Thomas Lee uh, out of the Harvard Macy Institute. And again, these are some great questions that you can ask trainees. You know, what are you hoping patients say about you? What are you doing to at every visit to increase the chances they feel that way? What are the barriers? And does your team know that this is important uh, to you? Uh, these are, I always like to conclude each of these habits with things that we can do. Uh, to, to make a difference. So we can set those clear expectations, prime the learners, remember to give four to one positive reinforcing. Um, and when giving feedback, make sure we give learners time to improve uh, because it does, it does take time. And then coaching for improvement, which you all are the experts on and learner-centered action plans. So I want you to, to now think about and put in the, the chat, what is one thing that you're going to do differently? It doesn't have to be something big. These are our, our baby steps move mountains. But what's one thing that you're going to do differently over this next month? Um, thinking about growth mindset. Are you going to talk about those? Are you going to talk about your, your experiences, your failures, and your successes? Looking at building rapport and team psychological safety. Is it setting the learners up to succeed? But what is that one thing that you're going to do differently? And I, I also talk about this as a component of the reason that we do this is for these individuals. It is for our trainees. I am so thankful. Um, because they allow me to grow and be a better teacher and leader every single day. A and I can't thank you all enough for giving me this opportunity to speak about something I am very passionate about. If you want to know more about growth mindset, I, I have a wiki that has activities and, and different things on it. Um, the address is down there. You do have to log in. It's a free site. Uh, it's a closed site, so once you go in, you'll ask for access, and I'll usually I can usually get to that in about 24 hours to uh, grant that access. 
but I also want to say I want to close with with one of the the la one of the cards that one of the interns said. They said teaching can be a thankless job. Be reassured, you are making a difference, and thank you for all you do. So thank you all, and I'll take any questions that that people have. I'll, I'll take. Um, I can stop the the screen share growthmindset.pbworks.com if if you're interested in in that. Carrie, that was phenomenal. What a powerful talk, and I'm I'm going to take home the what you said at the beginning that our mindsets of as teachers can influence the outcomes of our learners that we have that ability to inspire and um, expect the very best and and help help set them up for success through our expectations i love all the micro micro habits you gave us i'll remember the car that i made instead of the <laughs> rocket um, and we have some great questions coming in to start off would love to hear your perspective on how do you balance setting expectations while also encouraging some flexibility and ambiguity? The idea that maybe figuring out the process for yourself can also have value. You're exactly right. And, and setting expectations is really about the outcomes. Um, what, what are you, what's the outcomes? It, it's not how you're gonna get to the outcomes. There's multiple ways that, that you might get to that but it's really being clear on the outcomes. It, it may be too, uh, on being very explicit. Um, like, like for me, sometimes uh, there are certain things that are very helpful for me. I need to see lab values. Uh, I'm a very visual, I've got to see them somewhere in, in front of me, but everything else, how you keep them on your page, how you remember, do you wanna use your notes? That's fine. I don't care whether you use your notes during rounds. So that's that flexibility but focusing on what you need to, to see at, at the end. Fantastic. And then as people are putting more um, questions in the chat, there's a question about how do we adapt to different um, pedagogical approaches to different, uh, to different learning perspectives? So to me, it, it's asking. Uh, so one of the most powerful things that happened early in my career is I was working with a medical student and uh, I had had all of my schooling. I had my master's in education. I'd taken courses in how to be a, a, a great teacher. I'd gotten awards in being a great teacher and I got my evaluations back and they weren't great. Um, so I asked the learner, I said, you know, I I'm not meeting your needs. And, and this is about you and how you learn best. So what are things that I could do that would help you learn better? Uh, also, I read voraciously. I, I look in the literature. I learn about new things uh, and I try them out and they might flop the first time. I tell my learners, I call everything a pilot. I'm going to pilot something today and tell me what works and what doesn't. And I'm going to keep trying because it, it, it's going to take practice for me to get better. That's great. Thanks, Terry. Um, we have a great comment from Dr. Michael Chang, who was one of our was our fellowship director in Hemonk. He said, "Thanks for the fantastic talk. Do your evaluations consider the growth mindset? For example, did the learner work hard? Did they put in a lot of effort?" Um, and he makes the comment that I don't think we ask that, and that's a great point, Michael. No, I, I agree. Now, what we're trying to do is one teach growth mindset at the beginning of a residency. We also interview for growth mindset. So my favorite question is, can you tell me about a time that you failed or when something didn't go well? Um, it's, it's not that we're gonna get everybody that has that growth mindset, but really including, if you think about the milestones, which is how we evaluate trainees, um, it is about a continuum. It is not about where they are, but where they're they're going, and I agree. I haven't we haven't included on our I think on our continuity clinic because it's a longitudinal rotation. We're looking at growth, but we do ask our clinical competency committee and our faculty to to not just think about where they are or how they did on day one, but how much they've grown because that means more difference to me than than where they that growth over time than where they end up. I want them continuing to grow. Yes, I love that. The power of yet. Yes. <laughs> Fantastic. 
Um, and our, our last question is, um, how do you get to know someone without prying? Um, don't want to wish, don't wish to share the fear of judgment and thinking about how can we create a safe place in which we get to know our learners um, without it feeling intrusive. I would, I would say those, I would be authentic and say, I've not done this before. But one of the things I've learned about is the importance of getting to know people as an individual, but I'm not for sure what questions to ask without being prying or what are some questions that you want to know about me um maybe the the first and also i don't hesitate to ask the question or make the statement you're at, you seem different today than your normal self is everything okay and if they don't want to talk about it, that's okay. But I can encourage them to please talk to someone, if it's not me, to, to please talk to someone because something's going on and I can see that. And I care so much about them. It's not that they that they tell me what it is, but that they that they talk to someone. And that's the most important thing. And, and that's the key. And even if you make a mistake, uh, and one, one of our, our trainees talked about this, is, is he, was, he was saying they, they asked him about his wife, and, and he has a significant other whose name is Michael. But what the problem was is they just shut up. They became very quiet, and they didn't talk to him anymore. And the key is, is I made a mistake. Uh, and, and how is Michael? What are things that, that you and Michael do? And so that's kind of the, the key, being vulnerable, being authentic. I, I use the word authentic because people don't like the word vulnerable, but it's really a, about those human connections and know we're going to make mistakes. Um, and, and even when I teach, um, I, I had a learner that made a, that I was not happy with in, in clinic but then I did some things that didn't help the situation. So when we debriefed, I said, you know, I'm sorry that I went in and took over the case. I shouldn't have done that. Um, and he goes, you know, Dr. Turner, I shouldn't have yelled at the social worker. So I didn't even have to say you shouldn't yell. So that's being authentic. I was sorry for, for taking over the case. Thank you so much, Terry. I think you've given us such great habits and micro habits in thinking about growth mindset and thinking about how do we create psychological safety um, and coaching. Thank you so much for coming today. And I think we're going to introduce the, the rest of the day. Um, Serena's pulling up the slides now. There we go. Uh, so next we have two sets of workshops. Uh, next slide. We have at 9.15, Conflict Management by Sarah Hilgenberg, and then How to Assess Your Program's Anti-Racism Efforts by Aisha Barber, Lahia Yamane, and Felipe Perez. And then our second set of workshops um, are there in the Padlet. So if you go to the conference Padlet that has all the Zoom information you need, it's also being put in the chat right now. Um, please join us. We would love to have you and continue these conversations. Thank you, everyone. The preceding program is copyrighted by the Board of Trustees of the Leland Stanford Junior University. Please visit us at med.stanford.edu.